welcome to the Mac and Fish podcast. Our host, McKinley Roll, is back in the captain's chair. Corey Long will also join the show. Today's edition of Weekend Roundup will discuss Notre Dame versus Clemson, Alabama versus Florida. Does Ohio State deserve to be in the playoffs? What about Texas A&M? Let's get started. Hey, everyone. This is uh, Coach McKinley Roll here for the weekend wrap-up. I'm here with my co-host, Charles Fishbein, better known as Fish. Fish, what's going on? Hey, what's up? I got a dilemma before you get into the rest of our intro, all right? With Christmas coming up, and you guys know that I have a son. He's 11 years old. And we got a problem. He still believes in Santa. And the problem we have with this is it used to not be that bad. But now he's asking for things like a Mac Pro, a Apple 12. Like, I'm wondering, a couple more years goes, is he going to ask for, like, a Lamborghini? Like, Santa can't afford the gifts anymore. Like, you got to let him know that Santa's hitting the pandemic. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, and, and therefore the gifts just, you know, the, the, these guys these gotta, the gifts have to be, I, you got to socially distance themselves from the tree so the gifts can't be what they used to be. I mean, I never, Corey, Corey, I didn't have this problem growing up. I was Jewish. My mom had th- Christmas Eve. We opened gifts on Christmas Eve. You know, like there was no Santa. So we got a problem. Hey, but you, he's blessed. He's blessed, man. All he's right. Blessed. Well, you 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 finish up with the intro. Sorry to interrupt <laughs> you, but I had to get that in there. So I, I know you were, you were waiting for that. Oh hey, yeah. We we also joined by our co-host Corey Long. Corey, what's going on? What's going on, guys? Hey man. So we had a, a great weekend of college football. Um, as you guys know, we had a couple of championship games. Uh, we could kind of recap and talk about as well as the Heisman mix. Um, there's a lot going on right now. Uh, we, we have a clear picture of uh, the teams that were selected for the playoffs, and uh, we can hop right into it. So first, I want to talk to both of you guys. Do you agree with the, sele- the committee uh, selection uh, of their picks with Notre Dame, Clemson, Alabama, and uh, who's their last one? Uh, Notre Dame, Clemson, Alabama, and Ohio State. Ohio State. Do you guys do you guys agree with that? Uh, do you think A and M should have been in there? Do you think? Well, obviously not Florida, but um, just give me your thoughts on that, and then I'll kind of hop in there as well. It's oh. it's like the, the the three of those spots are predetermined. It feels like it just does. I don't want to. I feel like Clemson, Alabama, and Ohio State. Like they start the season in those spots and they have to basically play their one team has to play their way in. That was Notre Dame this year. Mm-hmm. Many years that's Oklahoma, unfortunately. But uh the, but like Clemson, Alabama, and Ohio State have to play their way out of it. And I mean, based on that, if if you know that coming in, which most people do, they didn't play their way out of it. Ohio State won all six games they played. Alabama won all 11 games they played. Clemson won 10 out of 11, including uh, their conference title. So, yeah, those three teams, based on the fact that they don't have to – that they're basically given the benefit of the doubt, are going to get in. And after that, I mean, Notre Dame probably had the best resume of the teams that was available. They, they, They beat Clemson once. They beat North Carolina on the road. They had a couple other decent wins. Um they didn't look good yesterday at all, but you know, but 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 they were ten and zero. They were ten and zero. They were in a pretty good spot. They probably had a little bit of a margin of error. Uh, I like A and M. I like what A and M's done, especially in the second half of the season. I thought A and M, you know, quality team, quality wins, and uh, you know, it, it's when you're when you're not competing. For your conference title, it's just hard for me to justify it. It just is. I can't – I'm not saying they're not worthy, but, you know, if you're not in your conference championship game, it's hard to justify it. So, I, I mean, and but this kind of a weird year, you know, they're, they're – they. I feel like the SEC could have done something a little differently this last week in a weird year. You want to boost a chances – Georgia wasn't playing. You just tell Tennessee to get the heck out 
and make A&M in Georgia this past week. You know, say, hey, it's not a conference title game, but this is, this is the only top 10, another top 10 matchup. You know, give them an opportunity to get another impressive win. And instead, they didn't give them that opportunity. So, you know, whereas all these other conferences were playing it as they want, like the Big Ten's like, well, you need seven games to get the conference title. No, you need six. Or Ohio State only gets five. Well, screw it. You only need five. You know, but, you know, every team, they, every conference should have done it. What the ACC, the ACC, the dumbest conference on earth, actually did the smartest things. They invited Notre Dame in and put them in a spot where it was virtually impossible for them not to play Clemson in the title, in the, in the conference title game. Yeah. Fish, what, what do you think? Yeah. Listen, I was on the Notre Dame bandwagon all year. I've been pumping them. I said they're going to beat Clemson. But reality is at some point there needs to be some sort of criteria to get in. They Their playoff game was this weekend. Yes. I don't care what their record was in the regular season. They lost. Mm-hmm. You know, they lost. And at some point they, they made rules to help these teams out. I mean, Ohio State, all right, they, they went 6-0, and but they didn't play anybody. And that's sure. not a knock on them because you can only play who you did. It's the same people that are making the argument, hey, Ohio State won 6-0. and Well, Texas A&M played what on paper looked like a really hard schedule at the beginning of the year. You can't – I mean, if I said, hey, they're going to play LSU, they're going to play Alabama, they're going to play Auburn, they're going to play – Florida, you're Florida. saying you're saying there's no way they're coming out of that nine and one or eight and one, and then they do it, and oh well, they didn't play a hard schedule. The, the whole thing is they've made these rules all along, and then they've already had it made up that hey, three of the teams are in, and the fourth team is a playing game. Well, how about you have an actual playing game? They should they can play this weekend and have a playing game, and you have. Texas A&M and, and Notre Dame. Notre Dame, listen, like I said, I was on the Notre Dame bandwagon. I've been pumping them. So I was wrong. They lost, and they don't – They don't. I, I don't believe they deserve to be in there. I don't think Ohio State belongs in there because they haven't played enough games. Mm. I don't know how you put a team in that played five or six games and another team played a whole schedule. Mm. Like, let's be real. And then they end up playing Northwestern, and it's not the – Listen, Pat Fitzgerald, I told you, I think he's one of the top five to ten coaches in college football. But you get a team like Northwestern in the Big Ten Championship, like they they literally had it. They should have just said before the season, you're in the playoffs no matter what. You go, you know, and just done it like Florida did high school football this year. Hey, you're, you know, Miami Central. Hey, you played one and a half games, you're in. You know, let's just, you know, and that's a problem is – the NCA had a, a lot of great opportunities this year to add in games, to do something a little different, to try something different this year. Uh, Corey talked about it. They should have probably ended the season maybe two weeks ago. And they could have done so many things, and they didn't. And I think this – they basically went back to the BCS mm-hmm. or the things that people had these arguments that, you know, for the last few years, you knew who the top four teams were. But this year there are arguments for – you know, two lost teams that play 10 games, you know, and mm-hmm. I wouldn't put Oklahoma in, but they're playing well. I would have put in um, some of these other teams, but look, I mean, two weeks ago, Oregon wasn't in the, in the mix. They ended up winning the Pac-10 championship. What are they getting for it? Some crappy bowl game? Like what was the purpose of them playing in, in the Sunday? Game? They weren't even in the Pac-12 championship. And, and we, t- and we, t- and we like, were talking about it. Clay Helton wanted no part yeah, of Oregon. Uh, he wanted Washington. He, uh, when he heard the news, he's like, oh, man, there I goes mean, my the extension. Goes, the problem goes far greater. It's a, I mean, the NCAA doesn't run college football. The Power Five conferences do. They run it. So you're not really – you're never really going to get a real arbitrary – you know, you're not going to get any real transparency in anything. They pretty much – they decide, and I, you know, this was, I found this out several years ago. And actually it was a few years ago. Me and Herb Street had a, had a, had a disagreement on it. And it just, it almost feels like they're picking the teams that they won in August and they just got to, you know, when everybody else is just playing for show. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I understand why it's done that way. It's done that way to protect the power five conferences. They like, 
if the, if this if this thing opened up like we really wanted to, it would it would ruin really, it would tr- pretty much ruin the value of the Power Five conferences because if we'll take UCF if they had as much of a if they had as much of a um a pathway to a championship as Florida does now all of a sudden they can compete for the same players but they don't have the same standards to get into the schools. No, no doubt. So, you know, you have a lot. And also they can compete with the same players. And now coaches will take a couple, like, like if the whole thing was open, we wouldn't necessarily talk about Luke Fickle leaving Cincinnati. Why? Cause he can win a title at Cincinnati. That's why in basketball, we don't talk about Mark few leaving Gonzaga. He can have a top 10 recruiting class in Gonzaga and compete. They're number one right now. Gonzaga, no one even knows where Gonzaga is. They're the number one college basketball team on earth. Yeah, but you know? there's so more but, interest though. But, there's but, more but, interest. You're gonna you're gonna ruin the interest of the but, of the sport. But I but I think you guys are missing a couple things here. All right. First, number one, Cle- Notre Dame got embarrassed by Clemson. Okay. If we're gonna talk about the whole resume, everyone is just looking at the regular season and saying, hey, their body of work. They beat Clemson in the regular season. They, they went undefeated, X, Y, and Z. They shouldn't be uh, penalized for playing in the championship game. Notre Dame's not even in the ACC, really. I mean, they, they're, they're playing in it, but they're not really in the ACC. But let's talk about it. Texas A&M definitely should have been in there. And Fisher, absolutely right. Ohio State has no business being in the playoffs. Playing He's got embarrassed by X, Alabama. Y- I got embarrassed. They lost by twenty-eight points. But but my thing about it is this: they 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 beat Florida by a substantial. At the end of the day, if Florida beats Alabama, you're putting Alabama may not be in. Is Alabama in the playoffs if they lose? Probably yesterday. Again, remember, three teams are in. They got to play their way out. But but we're talking. Let, let's look at what. Let's look at a body of work. Let's look at a body of work. I, I truly do not think Ohio State deserves to be in. I don't think, but the way, like you said, Fish, okay. Notre yeah, Dame, I, I, Notre, I agree with Notre, that. Notre Dame had their play-in game yesterday. They got embarrassed. Did they look like a playoff team? Did they look like one of the top four playoff teams? They did for one quarter, and they didn't. But the problem is, if you're a playoff team, you score a touchdown when you're inside the five. You don't miss a field goal. They, Absolutely. You know, they 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 didn't. They played like a team that. Look scared, and then, yeah, honestly, they, it just—they they didn't look like they belonged. They—they they don't. They don't belong. They're not one of the top four teams in the country. I mean, I'm sorry. It, it just is what it is right now. You know, COVID is a is a crazy year, and I fish. I agree with you. We could have. It could have been a lot of different things that happened. They could have tried a lot of different things. Maybe eight teams this year. Maybe six teams. Maybe you have a play-in game to say who is going to be the, those in that spot. But I thought you know, ACC right now it's have, not good. Hmm? I thought the ACC, I mean the SEC, should have booked Texas A&M and Georgia. Once Georgia's game got canceled, which it got canceled last Sunday, I would have booked that game. I'd have said, you know what? If this way, if A&M, if A&M's the only only shot that A&M's going to have is to have another quality victory, I'm gonna give them the best shot at that. And you know but, why? But, but Corey, they could have Corey, done that because they can make up Corey, anything they want this year. Corey, they had a quality – they played a quality schedule. Should they play more games than Ohio but State But they did? needed another victory. The bottom line is why, they needed why? another win. They why? just did. Why? Let me, they let me, did. They let me, needed another win. Corey, why? let me – They didn't Corey, get the win that they needed. Corey, let me ask you something. If the ACC hadn't brought Notre Dame in this year, all right, mm-hmm. and Notre Dame had played an independent schedule – and they lost to Clemson like they did last night in the regular season, and then did not have the chance to play again but in they the ACC. Clemson in the regular season. All right, but I'm just saying with, that with, the without ACC Trevor Lawrence, in the regular season with, without Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, it doesn't matter. They beat them. It, it, they beat no, it them. matters. It matters. You know what? It, I mean, it, it, it matters. At the end of the day, you know what? I mean, I can look at situations where, I mean, Pittsburgh Steelers beat Cincinnati when Car- when Carson Palmer broke his leg. They still won the game. It didn't matter. They still went on and won a Super Bowl that year. It wasn't an asterisk Super Bowl. It wasn't like, hey, oh, yeah, well, they beat John Kitna, so it they, shouldn't count. No, they, they, they still won the Super Bowl. But they still like, had to go through the – It doesn't matter how you – Exactly. They still had to get through the process. There was talk no about process. It, fish. Talk this, about it, Fish. 
Well, they're we basically they just said from the, before the game even started. Well, if Notre Dame loses, no matter what, they're in. Like, then why play the game? Exactly. Why play the game? Exactly. They should have played the ACC as title. Poorly, the, as they, poorly run as the ACC is, they gave themselves the best shot for two teams. The, to get a, to play the ACC they should have said, "Listen, you're both their schedule." To give themselves the best shot for two teams. Then they shouldn't have played the game. They should have just said, both of you guys are in. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're both in. We'll see you in two weeks. Hey, why waste our time? It's not like like the ACC needed the money. The fans weren't there. So, like, what was the purpose of playing the game other than, hey, we're going to play them again? You know, I I, I just – I think it's a – it's making an excuse for a bad situation. Well, 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 you look at it. I think that the the playoff committee – moves the goalposts every year. It's never, you know, before it was, oh, you have to play in a conference championship game. Now it's it's something else. COVID obviously had its own rules. It, they're moving the goalposts, whatever fits the narrative. They wanted Notre Dame in, in, in the playoff uh, finals. They wanted, obviously, Alabama earned Because it. Texas A&M's not sexy. So it's like, <laughs> all right, you know what? Exactly. We, exactly. We, Exactly. Texas, Texas A&M goes undefeated. They're in the playoffs. So they beat Alabama. They, they're in. There's I, no, don't, I, don't know. I don't I don't know. I Honestly, really don't oh, know. So I, I, undefeated I, SEC team wouldn't I, make it in. Are you uh, all serious? I, I don't think off right now if they, you say that. They, no, they would. They, 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 right now y'all can finish this stupid no, conversation. No, no they would. They, they, they would. really say that. No, they would. But, no, but, but they, they, if they, they, all right, if they go undefeated but lose in the SEC championship, exactly, they probably wouldn't have been in. But they shouldn't lose. You know what? Some teams can't afford to lose. Some oh, teams can. And I right. said that. Well, then, well, you know what? No, no, say no, that. No. Then say that to all. What did I say? I but, said there are three teams that have to play their way out, and one team gets to play their well, way Well, they, they should say that before they the season starts so the teams. Can. The other three teams had to play their way out. Fit, they uh, did. Cor- 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 Corey, Corey got to go you're, you're, you're moving the goalposts. You're moving the goalposts. Goal post. I'm telling you the truth. Then you know what that, that, that's co- ridiculous. That's ridiculous. They should not. I'm have- not saying it's not ridiculous, but I'm telling you what it is. That- well, college football should just come out and say, "Hey, this is how it is. Exactly. If you lose it, if you lose a game, a And M, you're out." They're telling you that every week. They no, tell not. you that. They tell you that when they put out their rankings every week. They absolutely tell you how it is. Yeah. Florida no. lost to a team that was three and five. And they were favored by 23 but wait, points. Wait a second. Down one spot. Wait a second. Wait a second. They said if Florida won yesterday, there was a probability that they could have jumped AM and and ended up in yes. the playoffs. Yes. They yep. told you. And they, and they you, lost to AM. They tell you every week. <laughs> what am, you know what? Louisiana beat Iowa State by three touchdowns. And if Iowa State would have won yesterday, who would have had a better chance of getting in the playoffs? They were Louisiana. All right. They tell you every week exactly what the deal is. Well, you know what? When they did not punish Florida for the loss at LSU, they told you, you know what? That loss at LSU doesn't really matter to us. Corey, they're going to drive football fans away. And you know what they're going to have? They're going to have like four or five fan bases. And that's it. Good luck. That's what they at the end of the day, they don't uh, care. Well, they should care because. They should like basketball is. Like college basketball. They should care because it's still a money revenue generator for a lot of teams. Exactly. College football is nowhere near as popular as college college football thinks it is. Yeah, well, well I mean, again. The the day, well, we're, hey, we're, 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 wait, a, we're, wait a second. We don't every, have a every team in the SEC is about to make $75 million a year. I, I think they care. I think people yes, care. And those six states, they care. But college football isn't like – you go to North, no one gives it. No one gives a kick. No one cares about college football once you get past Virginia. You know, no one, you know they're not talking about – we're not talking about college football in Boston. Hey, no one cares who's college win football gets SEC better title. ratings. And a lot college, of people live in those places. Hey, college you football gets better ratings than the than pro sports. All right, so like, you know, come on. Yeah, there's yeah. never there's never been a college football game that's got the ratings of an NFL playoff game. No, I said you know it, that's it. The, that's, no, because college football, but college football states. Well, college, but football. college football, even bowl games have gotten better ratings than an NBA game before, that's plenty true. of times. That's true. Yeah, pro football is is the top of the mountain, but college football is. And college the, football will never be pro football. I never said it was. It, it I never it, said. It thinks it is. It really thinks it's on a level of pro football. Who said that? We're not saying idiots. that. We're not saying it's that. I'm not idiots. I'm not know? saying that. And college football could be so much better than it is, but again, it's run by idiots. Well, I, 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 let's roll this conversation back in. Let's let, let's go. 
you know, that, that, that was a spirited discussion we just had, which is, you know, always welcome in the Mac and Fish podcast. But uh, let's talk about the Heisman uh, Trophy Award. Um, I want you guys to give me your your picks. I'm going to go with, with mine, okay? Okay. Um, I will say it's got to be it's Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence uh, is more than likely going to win the Heisman. I think Clemson is playing the best right now. He's the best player on that team. That's evidenced by their uh, d- demolishment of Notre Dame when he played in, in that game. Um, I think that Kyle Trask is, is definitely helped by uh, Kyle Pitts, who I believe is the better player. Um, I believe that Mac Jones uh, is helped by Devonta Smith, right, who I believe is the better player. I think both of those guys make an argument for it should be in the Heisman contention, but they're not. Um, but I, I, I think it's got to be Trevor Lawrence. Fish, well, what do you think? Heisman, Corey? Heisman is a, I mean, it's unfortunate that Heisman is just a quarterback award now. It's not a real award. Yeah. If it was a real award, uh, Devonta Smith would be it. Because I think Devonta Smith's the best player by far. I, I agree. Think Najee Harris is a, is a slight hair behind him. I think, you know, Kyle Pitts. And then you can get to the quarterbacks, really. You know, but, and I mean, I think Trevor Lawrence is the best of that group. I don't even, I mean, I, I, I think Devonta Smith has a really good shot at winning. I think he's, I think, I think, I think, you know, the one thing about waiting a couple more weeks than they normally do, you get to really see, like, when we saw Alabama, Florida yesterday, the quarterbacks had some pretty gaudy numbers, but you look at, like, on the Florida side, Kadarius Tony and Kyle Pitts run that offense. I mm-hmm. mean, Kyle yeah. Trask, I mean, as much as Dan Mullen tries to make everything about Kyle Trask, which is the reason they're, they have they didn't win their last two games, Kadarius Tony is a baller. And, you know, when Kyle Pitts is healthy, you know, he's amazing. And, I mean, on the other side, it's far more obvious. I mean, the, who did who the ball go to yesterday? Najee Harris. You know, when things were when, – when all when all those feel Najee Harris was getting the football and he was going to carry you home, you know, you, you're, they're telling you who the best players are. So, I'm hopeful Devonta Smith wins because I think he deserves it more than any quarterback. I agree. Uh, fish. Trevor Lawrence should win it, period. I, I just – he showed it yesterday. He's the most valuable player. Uh, you put him – I, I think the game would have been very similar to the first game between Notre Dame and Clemson if Trevor Lawrence doesn't play. I, I think that's – he's a difference. And he's the best quarterback I've watched in my lifetime in college, and I've watched a lot of great ones. I mean, I, all the way back to Elway. I think – I mean, Woo! it's – yeah, I mean – I think he's the best quarterback. I really do. I mean, you got you got to look. He has one loss, and his one loss is against Joe Burrow, whose team was just flat out nasty last year. He'd be undefeated, and you could put him up there. Whether it's you know Elway, you could put him up there with Peyton Manning. You could put him up there with any of the greats that have played the college level. He is unbelievable, and I, he's he's an all around great quarterback. His anticipation, his ability to throw the ball in spots that other guys can't. I mean, I just, I think he's special. And God, you know, Corey's a Jets fan. He's going to end up with the guy next year. I feel sorry for Trevor. I, I definitely wouldn't even, uh, I'd hold out until somebody else, uh, you know, traded with the Jets because I wouldn't go play for the Jets, but he's phenomenal. And I agree with Corey. I think Devontae Smith and um, Najee Harris are the other two. Those two are the two best players at Alabama. I mean, what's his, you know, the quarterback's probably the third or fourth best player on that team. I don't think he's there. He's basically a modern day, and I'm not ripping the guy because he had a great career in college. He's basically what Gino Toretto was when he won the national, you know, the uh, Heisman Trophy for University of Miami. Devontae Smith is a, the probably one of the better receivers that's played in the last few years. I mean, he's a game breaker, and you saw, I mean, he makes it look so easy. Um, and teams know he's getting the ball and he still makes plays. But like I said, my vote goes for Trevor Lawrence and I'm, I'll stick with that. Yeah, I think, and I mean, the reason I would, the reason why Lawrence to me, I mean, would do that, it would be the best of the quarterbacks. If this is still a quarterback award is that you don't see Mac Jones and Kyle Trask do anything 
outside of throw a pass. And I, I don't mean that to discourage throwing passes, but like, you know, they can throw a high ball. Kyle Trask makes the amazing catch. You throw a slant. Devonta Smith shakes out six guys and scores. Trevor Lawrence does stuff. Like that 60 yard run he had against Ohio State last year for a touchdown, the run he had yesterday against the, like he does stuff with his legs. He's a playmaker. The other two aren't playmakers. They can get the ball to playmakers, but they're not playmakers by themselves. No, no, no I, doubt. No I agree. Doubt. I, 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 you know, I agree with you guys. You know, Lawrence is special. I think, Fish, you, you went a little – you got a little too happy with that as far as no, – I, 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 Him being the best quarterback. I, he's, shit, I, he's, I mean, is he better – I, I don't know if he's better than Deshaun Watson. You know what I mean? I, th- I think he's better than Deshaun Watson. I, I, I don't know. As good as Deshaun know. is. You know, as good as he is, I think he's better. I mean, I'm telling you, I mean, I've, I've seen performances in a, in national championship games. What, Michael Vick maybe had a better performance in his career? I mean, there's not many. Who, there's, Deshaun? No, Vince, than, Vince, than, Vince, than Vince Lawrence. Young? Vince Young? Vince Deshaun Young had a better performance than Lawrence in a national championship game. The uh-huh. Trump threw for over 400 yards in the that's game. What, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like three touchdowns. What are y'all talking hey, about? The, the, Deshaun, Deshaun, Deshaun Watson yeah. is special now. Deshaun Watson was – He's Deshaun special, but Trevor's at another. I don't know. Tre- Trevor's at another level. That's just not, my not, not 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 more than Watson. On that no. level than Watson. You, got, you guys, you can run with that. I'll run with what I got, man. I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll stick with what I got. I got you. Well, we're we're gonna beat you, but yeah, uh, that's fine. Good. That's fine. <laughs> that's your hey, opinion. Hey, so so right now we have uh, obviously it was uh, early signing day. Um, we had you know just a recap and touch a little bit on that. Um, you know, you see why the teams, these teams are consistently always, we're talking about these teams, right? Corey, you talked about these teams that are, are sort of locked into these spots and they have to play their way out. Yeah. And it so happens that they're collectively always getting the most talent, right? I mean, (laughs) Alabama, Alabama signed, fellas, Alabama signed arguably the best receiving class ever. Okay. Four of the top 10 receivers in the country. Yeah. They also they signed the two top offensive tackles in the nation. And then they signed three, uh, three of the top 12 defensive ends in the country. But wait a second. Rankings don't matter according to some people, but let's look. No, they matter. They matter. No, and, no, and, no. You could sign three stars and, and, and win <laughs> national titles. No, but wait can't. a second. No, Alabama, can't. Ohio State, LSU, Georgia, and Clemson are in the top five. Uh, <laughs> how many of those teams have played in the playoffs the last, like, five years? I think pretty much all of them. Exactly. All of them have. Exactly. So, so all you non-likers of, you know, five stars, oh, we could win with three stars, you take your little three stars. I'll bring my team full of five stars, and let's see who gets their butt whipped at but, the end but, of the day. But, Fish, that's an excuse. That What, we, what we've learned – is that is an excuse when you're not landing those type of players, you have to find something and say that, Oh, well, we're going to develop them. Oh, well, you know, you, whatever, can't make some kind of excuse for why you're not signing those type of players. Listen, if you want to play for national championships, if you want to consistently be in the top five in the country, if you want to have a stake, uh, a staple place in the college football rankings, you need to land quality players. Players win games. Coaches yep. manage games. Yep. Coaches put players in position, but players win games, period. Yep. There's no magical scheme with crappy players. I can promise you that. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, – yeah, the people that don't like that, – that, that have a problem with five-star players, are generally they, they don't have any on their team. <laughs> they had them, they love them. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, just, I mean, but look at it though look at it Corey. i mean georgia ohio state alabama yeah, clemson i mean it's uh you know and, and it all you know it all works together it all you know it all works in the sense that when this system again college football is run by five conferences that protect their interests and the players go to those five, con- you know, the top players go to the five conferences. And within that, you know, if you say that there's, you know, about 10 schools that legitimately have shots in national titles every year, 
they mostly go to those schools. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a great thing. Signing day is great. I love it for the kids. I, I really do. Um, you know, and, and we've covered it covered this thing for twenty years now. You know, I'm always I just you know I I, I always live the life of what if you know what if college football was really an open was really open it was really opened up and how how would how would how would teams recruit like if college football was opened up how would coastal carolina be able to capitalize on a 10 and 0 season in the recruiting ranks mm -hmm. you know they can't they can't right now they can get they'll probably get a better player than they've had but they're not going to get anywhere close to any, any elite talent mm -hmm. and that's why you know when i talked about basketball and it was like oh you know Gonzaga is located in Spokane, Washington, by the way. Uh, and, you know, they're able to get top 10 recruiting classes because they're a national, they're a national competitor. Uh, when I was growing up, Georgetown basketball, which is a very conservative liberal arts school in Washington, D.C., signed a guy named Patrick Ewing, who was the greatest thing to ever come through Boston, you know, ever come through the, the mid-Atlantic uh, basketball circuit. And it's like, those things can't happen in football. And that's kind of what, like, I, you know what I love? I love the fact that Deion Sanders went to Jackson State and actually tried to shake things up. He made a couple of little funny things. He got, like, the Juco kid that had committed to Georgia, and I think he got a kid that was committed to Florida that couldn't get in their clearinghouse. But it was nice to actually see somebody so far on the outside say, yeah, I'm going to try to go get players that there's no way they should come to a program that I'm at and to figure out, how to land one or two of them. And the problem is you just can't do it. You know, it's like, it's like when guy they're working at the coaches at USF and the coaches at Florida, beyond just their finances and their facilities and everything, they're almost working in two different, entirely different sports because mm -hmm. of what they're capable of being able to do. So, you know, signing day is great, but it, to me it encompasses the bigger problem in college football. Yeah, but but but, but I want to ask you guys real quick, Fish. I want to ask you guys a question, and Fish, you can answer this too. How how has er, early signing day changed signing day for programs? Right now, college football programs can now concentrate on the class of twenty twenty two, whatever case may be. I think early signing day has obviously put a put a different spin on how college football programs approach. National Signing Day. So what are you guys' thoughts on early signing day? I don't like it. And I think it, especially if your school is one of these schools that has to fire a coach and now you're, you're going to end up with a transition class and guys, you know, you're, it's, it makes it very difficult for that school to sign, uh, you know, guys early. But I wanted to make one point with what Corey said. The one difference too about football and basketball is the one and done rule. One and done rule has made it changes to the sport i mean the fact that you got to go to a you're going to alabama you're going there for three years and you want to make sure they're developing you to get to the nfl and college basketball players let's be honest most of them are already draft the guys that you know that are going to get drafted out of high school are just going to a place for six months so like how much development's going on there but you know but you know back back to the um early signing day i think the MCA should either get rid of it or they should move it to August because it, it really, there's no purpose. I mean, why have one in February? These schools are signing one or two players. Like really yeah. like, like th th that wasn't the purpose of it. The purpose was to get the guys that were going to sign early to sign early and that they could concentrate on the rest of the class. Well, like 90% of these kids are signing early. So what's the purpose of the, uh, later signing period and, yeah, but, and it's, but, it's, but, but, but don't you think though that a, a kid or a prospect should have the ability to see how a program has done throughout the year and evaluate that i mean you can't just say hey come in august and give us a hope and a prayer that you know we'll be you know i i, I think that's a lot to, to yeah, put into that i've always said i've always felt that you know what you're not like kids really should not pick a school one because of the coaches. They should pick mm -hmm. that school because that's where they want to spend the next three or four years of their life. Because I've already know, and you already know the average assistant coach stays at a school for two and a half years. So the guy that recruited you isn't going to be there for four years. So, you know, that part of it means something like you better like the place you're going because 
if you don't like it, you're not going to be there four years. You're going to transfer and you're going to keep transferring. But I just, I don't know. I don't like where the early signing period is right now. I think it, like I said, it, it makes it very difficult on a program. If you fire a coach, you're basically that year is shot for that program. You're basically throwing a class out and that should never be the case. You should, you should still be at a recover if you or if you're trying to get rid of a coach. Uh, the, the early signing day, I think it's, I, yeah, I remember when the first one came out a couple of years ago, we weren't sure what was going to happen. And you end up seeing 75, 80% of the kids signing. What, 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 what has determined the early signing day is academics. More kids are early enrolling. They're taking mm-hmm. classes over the summer and they're able to enroll in January. So February isn't even a date for them anymore because they're already out of high school. So, I mean, there's things we could do. We could adjust it. You can say that early signing day can only count for qualified early enrollers, Uh which could change some of that, which would be kind of interesting because at least then, I think think that works out on all ends because at least then you know the kids that are signing are going to be there in January and they're not early signing and then trying to get their academics straight and they might not end up qualifying. I think that works out on both ends. Uh, in general, I'm for moving the early signing day up. I like it. I don't mind it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I don't mind it. I feel like, again, because so many kids are early enrolling, I think the February date isn't, isn't what it used to be. But there are things they can do to make it a lot better. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I like the fact that it's a three-day period. More than anything, I like the fact that it's a couple of days. It allows some things to happen. Um, this was a weird year in general because there were no visits. Yeah, yeah, just you have a dead period that's extending all the way until April. So a lot of things that that might not normally exist are existing this year. Um, but in general, because of the early enrollees and because so many kids are enrolling early now, I mean, it's a majority of your of your FBS signees are early enrolling now. It's uh, I think it's needed. And get rid of the, get rid of the February date and go August and December. You know, I if you're going to have an early, early signing day, if that's well, not everybody's early enrolling, you know, no, I, I know, I know that, but February, February, no, like, gonna, two. Oh, I mean, you know, our, our buddy, Timmy Norling's going to have an overabundance of Juco kids. If you're only allowed to sign in December, you oh, know? <laughs> not going to have enough Juco's to place all the kids we're going to give them. Uh, trust me this year, there's going to be plenty of kids for Juco's because there's a lot of kids that are not getting enough. I mean, I see two players this week. Uh, one at Fort Lauderdale and another kid at South Broward that both are division one kids and they they're not having the spring to get recruited and evaluate. I, the kid at South Broward's a six, two, six, three, 220 pound linebacker. And I can tell you right now, the kid could play a Florida state, Miami or Florida. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but you know what that's hurting them. You know, what's really hurting them is, yeah. is the transfer portal coaches yeah. now are looking at it and they're saying, Hey, I need to get a college kid, a college prospect. Do I want a grown man or do I want a kid that I'm going to have to develop out of high school, right? So they get a college kid. That kid, that college kid is like gold to them. So that has hurt a lot of prospects in high school. We could talk about COVID. We could talk about X, Y, and Z. But if you're not an elite we, we prospect, got it. They're, they're they're hurt. The college football has got to put a limit on transfer portal. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. The idea that. The idea that a program can recruit 10 high school kids and figure we're going to get our other 15 through the portal, that can't work. It just can't. Well, it's not going to be good for college football. No, it's just, you're not. The reason why those kids in there are in the portal in the first place. Yeah, you know? Exactly. You're, exactly. You're, you're totally destroying the supply chain. By doing uh, don't, that. don't give me, oh, we're looking for culture and you're trying to freaking change the culture with a quick fix. I mean, that's yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, but are you, uh, let's be honest though. Okay. Let's have this conversation. Are you going to change your your culture from a kid that's leaving a program? He's leaving for a reason. Yeah. No, no kids are, are going there and say, "Hey, I, I, I had a great year, so let me go in the transfer portal." Like, you know what I mean? Like, no, the kids that are leaving are unhappy with the situation they're in. There's a reason right. why they're leaving. For whatever reason, you know, for whatever reason. It used to be guys left because they wanted to play closer to home, or there was yes. some sort of family situation. Now it's like, all right, I'm second on the depth chart. I didn't get enough reps. I mean, look at Ladanian Webb. Uh, here's a kid that you know signed with Florida State, and he got his reps. Well, he didn't get enough. Well, let me. And now he's at his. I mean, the kid went to two JUCOs, and now he's been at two colleges. So it's like four, 
four schools in four years? Like, is that a guy an NFL team's going to want to draft? I doubt yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, but do you want to put it on a, on web, or do you want to put it on the school that recruited him? Put it on yeah. FSU. They recruited him. No, right? I, I, there's no question. But I'm saying, like, you, you, you're, you're going to put all your resources into that. They put their resources in it, and now you got them for a year. And really, a kid like that, you're probably going to get the reward in the second year, and you didn't even get to the second year. It's like. You're yeah. going to have to change your ways of thinking when it comes to recruiting these kids. No doubt. No doubt. I I, I don't like it. Um, I see it firsthand as a, as a high school head coach, and, and it's going to burn a lot of bridges, right? I mean, you know, it, it all comes down to relationships. You know, both of you guys are in the business. Both of you guys understand recruiting. You've covered it a long time. It it, it uh, It's always, you know, everything is sick, uh, cyclical, right? I mean, it, it goes all in a cycle. So, you know. McKinley, it's showing at the high school level. I mean, these kids are going to four school high schools in four years. Like, what do you expect when they get to college? Yeah, like, I, I, I personally would not, unless it, uh, maybe I leave one spot or two spots for those kids. But if I was a college coach and a kid went to four high schools in four years, I'd think twice about taking that kid. I, I agree. just I agree with because you. Because you're going to sit there and tell me in two years from now, it's like the college coach – that tells me, hey, Fish, I could coach lazy out of a kid. You can't coach lazy out of a kid. No, no. Oh, no, you may, you may think you could coach. Like, are we saying something like college football should go to, you know, you got a, you got an 85 limit and you have to limit 10, of, and only 10 of those can be considered transfers, whether it be JUCO or portal guys on your limit, on your 85 limit? Yeah, they should have a and limit. That, and then, that, a- you know, yeah, which, which I think could work because it, it allowed – because I don't, because I think so many coaches are manipulating the rosters by this. It's like, you know, if you if you get if you get a, for example, if you get a player that only has done one year at another school, that's going to count against your ten uh, Scott transfer limit for three years, which a lot of coaches won't want, you know, because the whole thing was made more for graduate transfers than it mm-hmm. was for what it's become. Correct. Uh, you know, it was made for graduate training. But Corey, you can manipulate it because if you get a kid, you recruited a kid and you're like, oh man, this kid's really good. And then all of a sudden you watch him practice for three weeks and you, you could tell kind of right away if that kid can play at your school or not. All right. So now that kid can't play at your school. Well, you start putting him behind walk-ons on the depth chart. You're not forcing that kid out by you pushing him out but you're manipulating that roster in a way that that kid's getting the point. Like, Hey, I'm behind walk-ons. I'm never going to play. Hey coach, can I go in the portal? He's like, Oh, you want to go in the portal? Okay. No problem. Well, again, you know, that's my, my point is you just have to limit on your scholarship limit on your 85 scholarship limit. It should only be room for maybe 10 or 12. That would be classified as transfers. And that's just it. That's your number 12. Yeah. And that could be, like I said, that could be Juco kids. That could be, you know, that could, that could be transfer portal kids. Now, that's not going to work for everybody. I mean, hell, Kansas State, if they were only allowed to have 12 JUCO transfers on this roster one time, they wouldn't have a roster, you know, because they get about 50% of their kids from JUCO, through the JUCO the world. JUCO but, kids aren't really transferring. They're, they're done with their time. They're done with their – I see what you're and, saying. You know, there's a difference between a JUCO kid and a kid that's on a roster that just is unhappy that he's not playing anymore, you know. Yeah. And, and what you're going to have, too, is a new coaching staff's going to come in and they're going to start wanting their guys in there. So the quicker way to get them out is by, hey, listen, I, I, I'm not going to start them. So I'm going to force this kid out. And coaches don't want to force kids out. But if there's an easy way to do it, which the transfer portal is, then they're going to utilize it. Because coaches, jo- these guys' jobs are on the line. they got to win. And if that kid can't play for them, they're, they're going to force them out. We, we go right into bowl games. Like the first bowl game is Tuesday or, win- or Monday, I think. Yeah. What is that? Uh, uh, was that was that Char- the Charmin Bowl? What was that? Yeah, there's a bowl. Let me see. There's a bowl game. Is there a bowl for coaches that like hurt themselves and they take them out of the show for like a month? Because we need one of those bowls. Hey, you know what we need? We need them to, when they're doing these bowl games selection, they need to think about what is the most intriguing matchups. Like, I really want to see FAU versus FSU. Like, I know well, FSU not eligible. But... For a bowl. I'm sure every bowl opponent would want to see FSU this year. I mean, you know, <laughs> they want to see Duke. They want to see Northern Illinois. You know, there's a bowl game tomorrow at 2.30, the Myrtle Beach Bowl, Appalachian State against North Texas. Nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to see that game. You know, except for, the, except, for those, 
Seven I'm, not doing a, I'm not doing a damn thing at 2.30 tomorrow. I want to see it. The game I tell you I'm excited about, the game that I'll cover, the Outback Bowl, is Indiana and Ole Miss. And to see Ole Miss up close, oh, boy. That's, I, that's gonna, that's, that total's going over 150. You can, yeah, that, like, that's a, that's a basketball. One and it's going to end about 6.30. Yeah, that's a 75-70 to 70 ball game. Yes. All right. Last thing, let's, let's, let's end on this. I want to see what you guys think. Best prospect signed in the early signing period by FSU, Miami, Florida. All right, who goes first? I'll say Rod Orr. Um, for FSU? For, for FSU. For, uh, mm-hmm. Miami, for sure, Leonard Taylor. He's the best of all three. And uh, for Florida, probably Jason Marshall, the corner from Palmetto. So I think those are the three top – players that I've seen in all three classes. Yeah, I think for uh, Miami, I think it's James Williams, but it could be Leonard, too. I mean, either one of those two. Uh, for Florida, I would agree. I think Jason Marshall is next level. Uh-huh. For Florida State, probably Omarion Cooper, their DB out of the Fort Myers area, is the one that I think has the best upside. I was waiting for you to say Colby Gross. No, I wasn't going to say Colby <laughs> Gross or Jordan Eubanks. That wasn't happening. Uh, no, I, I I agree with uh, – I actually agree with Fish. I mean, I like Orr. You know, you look at his athleticism, you look at his size, his length, um, the potential that he has. Um, you know, but again, is, is he an elite kid? Uh, no. Um, I love Leonard Taylor. Leonard Taylor, there was a coach that was quoted saying that was the best prospect he has ever played against in the last 20 years. Um, and Leonard Taylor – uh, he's just very explosive. Um, the, the sky's the limit for him. Um, and then I like Marshall too. I like his length. I like his athleticism. And Florida has got into Miami too. So I think, you know, Miami and Florida State should be a little weary of that. They've gotten in South Florida this class. They've gotten into Florida this run. I think a lot of that to do with Florida State's ineptitude of recruiting in Miami. Yeah. And the fact that Manny Diaz isn't – he isn't Mario. He is, he, does, he he goes after the kids that he goes after. He goes after them hard, but he's not hell bent on getting them all. Whereas if say Mario was down there, he'd be hell bent on getting them all. Like yep. the idea would be, I don't want I don't want Leonard Taylor if I can't get Jason Marshall, Ed Corey Collier, yep. and his other three team. You know, I'm gonna take them all. Yep. My yep. question to you, when y'all say that, Leonard Taylor, mm-hmm. when was the like Miami signed some top in defensive tackle prospects. Mm-hmm. What was the last one that really pan out for him? Because Vince, Vince, Wolf, Vince Wolfork. I mean, yeah. from Wolf, South Florida. 20 years ago. It's yeah. been a long time since yeah. a guy from South Florida. I know they've yeah. had, they've had guys like, um, you know, the one kid that did, they, they had the, you know, the Macintosh kid from Cardinal Gibbons a couple yeah. of years ago that panned out, but he was a three-star kid. I liked him a lot. And yeah. I thought the all three Florida schools should recruit him, but it's been a while. I mean, it's yeah, been a I while mean, since. When they, when they, I remember when they signed Fortson. We all thought Fortson was a right. great thing. He didn't, you know, he struggled there. But Fortson got lazy in high school. You saw yeah. it at times. Like, yeah. Leonard Taylor does not take plays off. I mean, yeah. he and, really. And that's the same thing with FSU. They've had some, off over the years, they've had some offensive line recruits, but top end guys, the guys that you build your centerpiece around, they've missed on those guys. When they, yeah. when they put, the Abdul Bello, the Jawan Williams, the Landon Dickerson, who yeah, although yeah. Dickerson turned out to be pretty damn good. But they haven't landed the Evan Neals, the Laramie Tunzels, the guys correct, that are correct. literally the elite, the elite, the elite, 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 elite that you know they're playing from day one, and you're not yes. they're you're not missing on those guys. Well, and, and you look and you look at Taylor. I, I mean Corey. I mean he's he, he's got length. Yeah. He's got size. Oh, he's got I, speed. I, I love, he's got, I mean, he's listen, got to get off. Corey. Timmy Jernigan is probably one of the top defensive tackles to come out of the state in the last 10 yeah. years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You knew he was going to be great coming out of high school. They did not miss on that kid. There was no, like, he didn't, like, as good as Forreston was, you didn't see the same laziness out of Timmy Jernigan. There was coaches that told me, as much as we liked Forreston, there was coaches that told me they didn't like him. Yeah. And that was surprising. I'm like, are you sure? And they're like, you remember, Fish. I, I'll give you another name. Remember John Brown at Lakeland High School? Yeah, John Brown was like – We and you saw him the first time when he was a sophomore. We were yeah. like, this kid is the next freak. You know, this kid's like 
But I didn't think there was ever going to be. This was the next Aaron but, Donald as far as John Brown, Aaron Donald even existed. John Brown plateaued. He was yeah. really good as a sophomore, yeah. and you didn't see that great move from him after that. And no? yeah, I remember we were talking to uh, who was it? Dan McCarney. We were at Armwood High School. Yeah. We were Dan McCarney, who basically said John Brown couldn't have played for him at any school he ever coached. Yeah, not at USF, not at Iowa State. I'm like he could play for you at Iowa State. But, sh- but that shows you like he had tapped out, and he yeah. wasn't. A, remember, he had limitations too, right? He was six feet tall. He wasn't six three. Yeah, he was no. a little shorter than that. So, he had great. He was just great in high school, but it just didn't paint. It just didn't. No. It never transferred over. You know, it never transferred over the next level. Whereas you're right. When you looked at somebody like Timmy Jernigan, it was hard to. It was hard to see how he was not going to be great. But Corey, there's too many people who I, who have coached against Taylor. I've seen him on film. You know, uh, talking to Fish. Uh, I mean, the kid is a is a can't miss prospect. He's yeah. a can't miss prospect. He's going to have an impact. Now, can we say like he's going to be all ACC next year? I, I don't. I'm not going that far. But he'll be a three and done, and he'll no, be a no, first. No he'll be a no first doubt. round pick. No Listen, doubt. there's so much that goes in. Listen, there's so much that goes into a guy playing right away. I mean, Miami has guys that are actually there that are uh, like Nestor Silvera. They have other guys that have been that are have been there in that system for two years. So yeah. he's going to have to beat guys out. But Taylor's going to make an impact next year. No like, doubt. He no will doubt. be. He'll show his face next year. No doubt. So you you wanted to say something, Corey? You you, you got one final word? No, no, I got no. I'm good. I'm, I'm really good. I was uh, I was looking at some stuff. Apparently, though, what's up? Auburn is interviewing Bill Clark from UAB, which I think we all think is a very good move. But I think there's zero chance they will sign Bill Clark because the Auburn fan base will never accept a UAB coach coaching Auburn. Well, they're dumbasses. What, what what's the purpose? What's the purpose of firing Gus Mons and the to hire him? I I mean, remember they're, they're, they're I mean, there's still the belief that Kevin Steele is still the number one guy, and I just don't those. I like, I, I, I like Coach Steele. I like don't Coach like Steele. Coach Steele, but that ain't gonna fly at Auburn. Like, I mean, the idea why, is why, that why not? When, when they fired Gus, the idea is they're supposed to bring in somebody with a bigger name than Gus. And yeah, say yeah, we're, gonna, it, it, we're gonna fire Gus and hire his top. Yeah, assistant. but but you know what though? Just like Fish and I, well, Fish and I have had this conversation before. Yeah. You, you know, uh, I think college programs, college football programs, are seeing more and more. It's hard. Like, you know, you have these high profile jobs, and they think, oh, we're supposed to get a big name, and we're just gonna throw us out there and offer this oh, guy. I think and, I, I it, think it's not easy. Silly. Not easy. There's you know only I mean? like there's I mean, only they, like two or three they, jobs that can attract a big name. Coach. I think they're silly to think that they were gonna that somebody was gonna race into one of face the Saban machine up close. I think it's ridiculous. They're not gonna buy into Kevin Steele because Kevin Steele's a nine and thirty six record as a head coach. Yeah, now I would tell you, I think if University of Texas could have uh, could have got Urban Meyer, he's the next head coach at Texas. They couldn't fit. They could not close the deal, so they said, hey. Yeah. <laughs> Tom Herman is our well, head coach told next year. Tom Herman, we're going to keep you for a year until we try for Urban next year. <laughs> right? Until then, you keep his seat warm. You can fire me anytime you want if you're going to give me $25, $30 million to leave. So if you, want to, <laughs> if you want me on one-year rentals, listen, man, I know this. That check clears every two weeks at that school. Like, this ain't like that, that, that movie, The Office, where they keep moving you to the basement at Texas. That check's still clearing every week, all right? No, no, no doubt. No so doubt. I ain't worried about it. You want to fire me next year and bring an urban? Oh, I'll take my payout next year. Who cares? Yeah? Well, I enjoyed it. I hope you guys have a great holidays, great Christmas. Yes. Uh, I enjoyed my Hanukkah, my eight days of it. I had a, yeah, eight days. I, I had a buy Ethan eight, eight gifts. You know, so and, and now, and now, now Santa Claus has got to deliver the yeah. Rest. Santa's got to deliver the real. He has yeah. to bring the heat. I, I I don't know, man. Are the I, three of us gonna go to the Boca Raton Bowl? I'm going. Hey, McKinley, can you get I'm us tickets to the Boca, Boca Bowl? Bowl? You got me hey. tickets last year. Can you get me tickets? Hey, man, I, I I'll see if I still have some juice. We'll see. We'll see. Oh yeah. man, I, like wait you. a second. Last year you went zero and four, and we're able to get tickets this year. <laughs> Your coach of the year, coach of the year in Pearl Beach, and you can't get Jack. I mean, why am yeah, I even? Right. Fr- why am I friends yeah. with you anymore, man? 
Hey, uh, man, hey. Man, you are, honestly, this friendship ain't, listen, hey. this is 90-10. It's like me and you are married. Hey, if I it knew, is what it is. Hey, I, my wife's got 90-10. Now I got my, my good friend's 90-10. You get all the juice and yeah. you don't. Oh, uh, Corey, hey, we got to do something about this relationship, yeah. man. I mean, he shows up once a month hey, to the co- show co- now. Co- hey, 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 COVID, co- hey, COVID, man. COVID, yeah, COVID. COVID. I, I got COVID for you right here, man. <laughs> COVID, my ass. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Uh, don't <laughs> hey, let me don't let me bring Nate Giggy in to take your host spot here, all right? <laughs> hey man, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. we're gonna have to bring Nate the Insider in to co-host with me. Hey right? man, get, hey, get him my boy Nate, man. Get him right. boy Nate. <laughs> hey, I'll send him the link and say, listen, man, we got a spot for you as the host. <laughs> I'll give you the host spot, Nate. Don't worry about it. We're all good. I know I ripped you every month. I know I ripped you all the time on the internet, but we're good. Don't worry hey, about it. Hey, hey, Nate, Nate's a true insider, man. He's oh, I know he is, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all good. You know, he, hey, he just needs to know I love him, man. It's all good. I don't. I have no hate in this heart, none. But I'll see you guys later. Enjoy, right. enjoy your hotel there, man. It looks like a nice little suite you got there. <laughs>